programming note to begin, there's gonna be a lot of Japanese words and phrases in this video. I actually did take a little bit of Japanese in school because I'm from Hawaii and there's a large Japanese population there, but there is still bound to be some mispronunciations. As my grandmother used to say, don't come for me unless I've sit for you. My grandmother didn't say that. So it's the early 19th century, and there's a Shingon Buddhist monk named Tetsumonkai who's traveling through what is present-day Tokyo. He comes upon this region where all of these people are being rendered blind by this terrible disease. He's a deeply compassionate man, so he wants to help those who've been afflicted. Despite his training with herbal medicine, Tetsumonkai was not able to cure the disease. But he had an idea. You see, he was an Isegyonin, or a devoted lifelong aesthetic Buddhist, meaning he believed that self-deprivation and self-torture were a means to help the community. That's like me. I am like that. You guys don't even know what I do for you. It would blow your mind. Those in this sect of Buddhism thought that if their body was weak, their spirit would actually be stronger, giving them the ability to help people, even cure them. So Tetsumonkai cut out his left eye and threw it in the Sumida River in hopes that his sacrifice would cure the people of the region. While it's unclear whether Tetsumonkai's sacrifice actually did anything for the blind, the epidemic did end, eventually. What we do know is it set him on this path of extreme austerity towards self-mummification. Self-mummification, is that even possible? Aren't things like oxygen and moisture and bacteria and fat all found in the living human body the enemies of mummification? Yes, but in this obscure and ancient practice, that kind of self-discipline could lead to you becoming Sokushinbutsu, or Buddha in the flesh. The Japanese translation app literally translates Sokushinbutsu as instant Buddha, which calls to mind those capsules you used to have when you were little that you put in hot water, and voila, instant dinosaur, instant farm animal, instant Buddha. As delightful as that sounds, the process of self-mummification was, believe it or not, quite the opposite. If this were my Tumblr post, this is where I would warn you about disordered eating ahead. Like, very much so. Upon deciding to become a Sokushinbutsu, a monk would adopt a tree-eating diet. In those first 1,000 days, he would only eat buckwheat, millet, and fruits and vegetables. The monk would also commit to a strenuous regimen of physical exercise, causing him to quickly lose body fat. The less fat a body has, the less moisture and heat that it retains. Two things that the bacteria love when it comes to decomposing a body. Mummification, Mummification. here we Two. come. Ah. In the second phase of self-mummification, the next 1,000 days, the monk would restrict his diet even more, only eating such foods, loosely defined, as tree bark, pine needles, and sometimes rocks. Also during this time, it was not uncommon for him to drink tea made from the sap of the urushi tree. Typically used to make lacquer varnish, this tea would cause excessive sweating, rashes, vomiting, and dehydration. Not only would this further dehydrate the monk, the toxin in the urushi tea would build up in his body, making it inhospitable for flesh-eating maggots once he died. And when he wasn't eating bark or vomiting, the monk was in a near constant state of stillness and meditation, facilitating the loss of muscle tissue. Finally, after upwards of 2,000 days of self-deprivation, that's over five years, the monk was ready to meet his death. The emaciated monk would climb into his tiny tomb, just large enough to sit in the lotus position. He would be sealed from the outside world with only a thin bamboo tube for air and a tiny bell to ring every day, indicating that he was still alive. Once the bell stopped ringing, it would be assumed that he was dead and the tomb would be completely sealed for, you guessed it, another 1,000 days. After those 1,000 days, the tomb would be open to see if the monk did indeed mummify. 
If he had, he would be taken out and put in a temple and honored as a Buddha. If he hadn't, if he had decomposed, then he would be buried, but still given a place of honor and respect for his endeavor and his attempt. Decomposition was like the honorable mention of Sokushin Butsu. Those millennials always wanting their participation trophies. From the 11th century all the way up to the 20th century when it was outlawed, over a hundred Japanese monks attempted to become Sokushin Butsu, but only two dozen succeeded. Of those successful self-mummifiers, most of them were from the north of Japan, the Yamagata prefecture, and many of them can still be seen today, including our friend Tetsumonkai. With a practice that's as rare and admittedly unsettling as Sokushin Butsu, it's easy to forget that these monks weren't doing this like Iron Man just to prove their endurance and prove they could do it. They genuinely believed that this self-sacrifice was going to help humanity. As long as their intact bodies remained on Earth, their spirits could be in the beyond offering help to the living. Even now, Tetsumonkai's mummified body is prayed to for, among other things, the alleviation of eye illness. Which is your favorite strange and unusual mummy? Which mummification practice do you want to hear more about? Does everyone just want to hear about La Pascualita? Tell me in the comments and maybe we'll talk about your mummy of choice in an upcoming video. Brought to you with support from People's Memorial Association and the Co-op Funeral Home, and donations from viewers like you. Do you like mummies? Would you like to hear more about them? Pre-order my new book, From Here to Eternity, today. There are mummies in that book. Mummy. 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 Mummies. <laughs>